you've got societal norms, right? You've broken societal norms, right? Everyone said, be safe, play it safe, do your government job, put your head down, do that for 20 and you're sleeping your life away and you're missing out on the opportunity, right? Yep. Well, society has all sorts of batshit dumb ideas for everything in life. You need eight hours of sleep. Who said that? Is that true or is that belief driven? Because mm. let me tell you about me. I'm one of the highest energy individuals that I know on the planet. I don't take stimulants. I don't put caffeine in my body. There ain't no Adderall there. I got energy by choice. And this energy starts at 4 a.m. And this energy lasts till 10 p.m. I would say probably 90 or 95% of the time. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report. Today, I'm sitting out here in Provo, Utah with my man, the legend. I got Mr. Chris Cohn. Chris, welcome to the show, brother. Dude, man, happy to be here. Yeah, man. I appreciate you having me out to uh, Provo, man. Impressed with your whole setup here. Your whole team's been amazing today. And you. uh, dude, your guys' energy is just like second to none. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. man. So, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of listeners are, are familiar with, your, with you, but a lot of them don't really know your story, man. Like, what, I'm just, and I don't know either. I'm curious, yeah. what were you doing before real estate? So I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, if we were to back up like a long time ago, I, I come from a family where I have a German immigrant father, had uh, met my mom, had nine kids, big family, I'm number four, and my parents fought about money all the time. And so that really influenced a lot of my decisions on what I wanted to do when I grew up. Uh, my dad, uh, he just, he was belting on me. He said, son, get good grades, go to college. That's the ticket. Cause he didn't have me on a third grade education. So I did that. I worked really hard. I, uh, I, I got, you know, I had to put in a lot of effort to get good grades. There's a lot of that, that I had more street smarts, I think, than academia in me. And I remember when I was a teenager, I said, I'm going to be a doctor. Cause I've got to take care of not one family, but two. I'm gonna have my own family and I just had this calling inside. It was a God thing. I'm like, I'm gonna take care of my parents. Out of all my siblings, I feel like that's my responsibility. So I needed to have enough family, enough money for two families. And um, when I started going to college and started taking my pre-med classes, uh, organic chemistry kicked my ass. And mm. uh, I took it again. I got a worse grade on the second go around. They were grading on a curve. So they were trying to fail as many people as possible. And it was the first time in my life, it was my young life, but I, I, I quit. And um, I listened to my advisor that said, dude, this doesn't come naturally. You're not going to be happy. Mm. So like when I, qu when I basically quit out of that game, I was like, I remember sitting down and saying, hey, tell me all of my other options in college. And you're like, well, you could be an architect and make 90,000 a year. Or you could be, you know, a marketing director, and make, you know, $80,000 a year. Or you could be a psychologist, and make $65,000 a year. You could be a teacher, make $42,000 a year. As they were running through the numbers and I'm like, well, doctors seem to make the most money and everything else seems to make less. And I have to supply for two families. And I remember that day leaving school feeling so deflated because I was like, well, I'm wasting my life being here. This is not where I'm supposed to be. There, a decision was made, which is I have to go outside of the walls of university to find my higher calling and purpose in life. And so when you decided to quit, did you have any sort of game plan in play? No. Did you know what the next step no, would dude, be? I was, dude, I was sad. Like I was depressed. I was, I, was, I, was, I was pretty messed up by it. Yeah. I feel like, you know, when I was in college, the same thing, because, you know, Society teaches us we should know at 18 years old, 20 what years old, we want to do when we like, exactly our past. That's such a joke. And I'm like, dude, looking back, like 18, 20, like you're just a little kid. Yeah. There's no way you're going to know what, what you want to do in life. And so, you know, and I was the same way, man. When, when I felt stuck and I didn't know what I really wanted to do, yep. I felt like I was behind. I felt like I was behind society. And they kind of make you feel that way. And there was, a, there was a day that put the nail in the coffin, though. I had a telemarketing job. I was not making great money. Like this is my first adultish job while I was also, you know, full-time student. And you know, that year, that first year I made like 18 grand. So I did not make a lot of money. It was more money than I had ever made before though. And I remember just one day I was done with school. I felt depressed. Um, then I get to this telemarketing job where all day long I'm talking to people that don't want to talk to me. That's depressing. And I remember just thinking, oh my gosh, it's like four more hours to like late afternoon lunch. I haven't even seen my wife today. I want to go see her because I was, I got married young. I met her on the third day of college. How old were you? 22. Mm. So I drive home to see her. And before I get to the front door of our basement apartment, there's this little hole in the ground, $400 a month, you know, the cheapest thing in town. And I remember before I knocked on the door, I had this really bad feeling like something, something is wrong. And when I finally knocked on the door, my wife came to the door and she was crying. She had, her, her tears uh, were just streaking down her face. Mm. And so I stepped inside the apartment and, and finally had enough courage to ask what's wrong. And then she said something really unexpected. She said, well, we have tuition due in three weeks and we can't pay it. And I thought, yeah, that's a problem. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking I could get into student debt, student loans. Like I, I can solve that. And then she said, 
Chris, we have rent due in five days and we already spent our paycheck. Mm. And I thought, oh, I don't know what happens. Do I like get kicked out? But then I still thought that can't be it. And then I found out that she had gone grocery shopping a few hours earlier and we had no money in our bank account. And she paid for just a week's worth of groceries with a check that bounced. And she was so embarrassed, had never had that happen before, that she just, she came home empty handed without groceries. And that is what set her off. Mm. And it was in that moment that I'm like, oh my gosh, I just experienced my first massive failure as a husband because I did not provide for my wife. And in that moment, all I saw was backflash, the flashbacks of my, my parents fighting about money. I'm like, this is it. This is the game. This is what it's going to be like. We're going to fight about money. And I just thought, you know what? No, that is not going to be. And that's the number one cause of a divorce in America is, is money, money finances. Sex. Yeah. So I just, I, I walked out of that moment. I said, I will do whatever it takes to never have to deal with this again. And a short time later, I met my first mentor that made over 10 million in real estate. That year, I would meet two more. Each of them had made over 10 million in real estate. And I started following them around. And uh, a year later, I started, you know, I finally had enough money saved for my first real estate deal. And then four years after that, I had 25 homes and they were paying me a basic six figure residual income. And just when I graduated college, I never needed to get a job and I was done. How did you fund those first handful of uh, homes early on without, without having any money? So it took me 14 months to save up five grand. Okay. And five grand was enough for a 3% down payment and FHA low on this tiny, it was this tiny little bungalow that also had a mother-in-law basement apartment. So when I bought that, I was able to run out the basement and cover the entire mortgage, which meant that we lived in the three bedroom upstairs for free. Mm. And that's when I got my first taste of, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? They say that your biggest expense in life is your mortgage. And now I don't have one. And that's when I'm like, shoot, if one deal tastes this good, then I bet more deals taste better. Yeah. It's, um, I think that's like one of the best ways to get started. You know, I, p- people ask me all the time, Hey, what should I do? I'm like, well, if you don't have any money, save up for a three and a half percent down FHA yep. loan. And there's even credit unions out there that will do no money down on a primary residence yep. and go house hack it, rent out the other rooms. Yep. You live basically mortgage free. Um, and then that allows you to save your biggest living expense. And then after another year, you have enough for another down payment. Well, and actually what ended up happening was I bought the house below market. And that next year after it seasoned for 12 months, I was able to get a home equity line of credit. And I used the first house to put up the down payment for my second house. And I used the equity in my second house to do the exact same thing. So I was basically buying on, I, I was buying these homes at a discount. And so I got them to basically finance each other. Yeah. Now, how old were you when you, when you did the first one? 23. Wow. So at 23, you learned how to play Monopoly, basically. Yeah. And uh, that was my favorite game, actually, as a kid growing up. And by, <laughs> was it? And by 26, I graduated. I didn't need a job. And I went from full-time student and full-time job to graduated student and needing no job. And my wife and I actually, at that point, we had just finished building this $1.8 million home uh, custom build right on the golf course outside of Sundance a few minutes from here. And uh, we moved into that. And like, it was the weirdest thing to be just out of college and, and living that lifestyle. So give me a snapshot of what you're doing today. What is, what does your real estate portfolio look like today? And just give me a snapshot of like what your, your businesses look like. So I I like machines. I like machines that build machines. I'm very, very stingy with my time. You know, we're going to be awake for 18 or 20 hours today. And I don't want my time to be used the way other human beings use their time, which means if it's ever going to be repeated, Unless it's sex, I'm never going to do it again. Mm. Like, in other words, on this planet, there's nothing that I want to repeat if I can delegate it and have someone else do it. So today, I will buy a piece of property in one of the best markets in the country. Someone else will use their money. Someone else will use their credit. And my team will do all of the work. And everything will be done 100% independent of me. And that deal will probably make, on average, 34% annual ROI. And that house will double, um, you know, with compounding uh, interest, it's going to, you know, it, it, money's going to double every two years. And um, that entire process is 100% done independent of me. So every day my portfolio grows by a door. Okay. And what else are you doing in terms of business? Um, a lot of private equity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, where I'm having a lot of fun right now is um, I used to raise money for real estate. Now I raise money for buying businesses. And I just had a conversation with the CEO of one of my companies, Fortify, that specializes in consult for equities. So I have a, I have a network out here of people that are basically looking 
for people that want to sell their companies and they bring them to me and they basically say, will you help me? Will you cut me in on the deal if you can help work a deal? And so we're doing a lot of leverage buyouts. We're doing consult for equities. I'm basically acquiring companies, prepping them for sell. You know, and over the next decade, I want to do 10,000 of these. I want to, I want to own 10,000 companies. I mean, in the next seven years, we, we talked about it on your show earlier. We got thousands and thousands and thousands of small businesses that are owned by these baby boomers that are going to be retiring over the next seven There's years. One million home, there are 1 million businesses for sale in the country right now. And based on the stats of the last five years average, only one in 16 of them will sell. That means that 80,000 businesses will sell in the next 12 months and, and 920,000 of them won't. That's a lot of motivated business owners. And the reason why they're not selling is they either have unrealistic prices. Um, they're in that really weird gap where they're not large enough to be enticing to private equity you know, companies that want to come in and on the low end, they want to start deploying $20 million for something, right? They don't, they don't want to buy up a one or two or $3 million company. And the average Joe doesn't have one or two, $3 million to buy a company. And so that creates, especially between the five and $20 million mark, that creates a lot of a lot of fear for business owners that said, well, my business is actually successful. It's better than average, but there's not a huge buying pool. And those are the companies that I target. And so with a lot of those companies that are not being bought, do you think they're just going to die when these, these yep. folks retire? Oh yeah. That 87% of them, they won't transact and they'll just literally go to the grave. The, the kids and the grandkids don't want them? They don't. Um, the, the, uh, why is that? Why is that? Uh, there's such a disconnect from the old generation. I mean, we're, we're talking boomers. And we're talking about Gen Z, right? Like even millennials, it's just like, there's such a disconnect. Gen, you know, millennials at age 40 had five times less money than boomers at the exact same age. They just don't value the same thing. They don't value that, that real estate, the white picket fence. They don't value saving and investing. You know, this generation that wants fl flexibility, they want mobility. Uh, they don't want to be tied down. They want to be able to live life on their terms, but they're sacrificing enormous wealth for those choices. Yeah. I had a, a demographer on my podcast a, a couple years back. He wrote the book, Big Shifts Ahead. And so he labels all the generations based on the decade. And yeah. so, you know, if you were born in the 40s, he calls them the savers because they grew up, Out watched their depression. parents get rocked in the Great Depression. Yeah. So they they had the scarcity mindset. And it's so true. My parents grew up in the early 40s. That's when they were born. And they are just save, save, save. That's their mentality. No risk. Very, very low risk tolerance. And he labels the folks born in the 80s, the millennials, as the sharers because they want to go have all these experiences yes. and they want to share it with all their friends. They don't care about owning anything or building anything, but they want to go have these experiences and share it with their friends. So he calls them the sharers, which is interesting. You know, yeah. and you're seeing that, you know, mindset drive a lot of fundamentals within our economy. Like it's a lot of the small businesses, the restaurants, the hotels, the chain restaurants are phasing out because people value these one off unique stays and experiences, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. So, you know, what, what do you think is going to happen over the next seven years with all these businesses dying? We got this younger generation that doesn't want to pick up these businesses. There's going to be the greatest transfer of wealth over the next seven years in yeah, American or, history. Or the greatest graveyard of wealth that could have transferred. Mm. I mean, that's the reality is, is that the wealth's not going to transfer. So you, we were talking about trillions of dollars just going to dust. 100 years from now, no one's going to remember you. You're going to be a picture on someone's wall. Um, your car will have been rusted and recycled and chopped up and reused for something else. Nothing you did will have mattered, right? A hundred years, you, it's, not, it's like you didn't even exist. And that really ch changes the way that we look at the world and the things that we do in it. And I think that's part of the reason why, why millennials and Gen Z are the way that they are is because they're starting to realize, well, what is it that really matters? I don't want to be a saver. What's the purpose of saving up hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars and never making a memory, right? And so there's balance in the game. If you learn to be an investor, then don't be a saver and, and, don't, and, and, and don't be reckless like my parents were. You know, my wife, when I married into her family, they're the most frugal people I've ever met. So I have, as in-laws and parents, the two opposite spectrums where I'm like, oh, hell no, I don't want to be a saver. That's even worse than reckless. Reckless, you at least get to have fun. You're stressed, but you're having fun. And if you take a look at the, at the savers, they don't have any fun. They, they, they can't spend money on anything for the life of them to build a memory. I want to be the investor that makes, <laughs> that makes the money that then learns how to spend it and share it, by the way, and create amazing memories. Because my world is built right now, my currency is experience. Mm. I want that above all. And there's a lot of really cool experience that you can have for very little money. And then there's some experiences that I want to have that definitely take, like, for example, I'm like, I'm going to New York for a bunch of TV interviews in a couple of weeks. And I'm like, I'm going to take all my friends with me mm -hmm. and we're going to go to a Broadway show and we're, we're going to chill with the producers. We're going to, we're going to do a half a day of interviews 
And then we're going to live it up and we're just going to have a blast. And guess what I'm more excited about? Am I more excited to get millions of, of viewership on TV or I'm more excited to hit Broadway with my friends and family. So you're, you're a sharer too, just yes. like, just like the demographic. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. No, I, and I think you get to a certain point where it's like, you know, what's your why and your why is always evolving. And so for me early on, I was like, I just wanted to get a little bit of passive income and buy a deal. But then it's like, okay, as I do more and more, it's like, I, I don't want to do it alone. Yeah. I want to share it with my friends. I want to share it with my team. Yeah. There's so much money in the world that everyone can win. If you are a busy professional and don't have time to invest in real estate, but still want to participate in the passive income and tax benefits, my team, Summers Capital, is buying a lot of boutique hotels right now. We source the deals, we renovate the properties, and we even do all the day-to-day -day management, making it truly hands-off for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, go to summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. I'm building a uh, 28,000 square foot addition on my home right now. So the house, when it's all done, will be closer to like, I don't know, 35 or 40. What, what, are, you, what are you building with the 28,000 uh, um, addition? It is, it, you know, it's, it's probably best described as a rec center. Like it is, a, it is a community center for my closest friends and family and masterminds to get together and have a shared experience. Um, it's got a 3,200 square foot gym in it. It's got a four-story climbing wall. It's got a racquetball court. It has a full spa with all of the rooms that you could want in a, in a commercial spa. Wow. Uh, it's got a retractable pool, like this huge room. It's all glass ceiling. It's really cool with this pool that literally just disappears or comes up. Disappears. Yeah, retractable. So that means- The pool uh, just it, goes into the ground? It, yeah. So it, when it's down, it's a pool. When it comes up partway, it's a reflection pool. When it's up all the way, you don't even know that it's under you. Wow. And, uh, you know, and, um, you know, building my wife a crystal gallery because that's a hobby and passion of hers. I've got a two story, three story office, you know, going in there for me, adding a 13 car garage for just fun sake. So Got right me. right now we're here in your event center and podcast studio. And yeah. so you do a lot of your office work here, correct? I do. Yeah. Content. No, no will, I, will I, it I'll come in I'll come in on Mondays. Mondays I'll come in okay. for um, you know, for video day. But other than that, I have two other days and I work for Will me. you still come down here for content days? Or just you, once a week. It won't be at your new pad. Um, I don't know. I, I might actually exit the studio and do those up there. I yeah. mean, it's going to be such a beautiful place. Dude, you're never going to leave. Kind of. I mean, <laughs> dude, the way I designed it is it's built on everything that I like to do with my life all in one place because it's either the jet is taking us somewhere really fun or cool or meaningful on the planet or I'm just back home. I don't like to commute. I don't like to go places. If it's by chopper, great. If it's by jet, great. I don't drive anymore. I'm driven because I just, I, for me, I'm so stingy with my time. Yeah. I just, I don't, I don't want to waste time. So speaking of time, um, you know, I've heard you allude to like, Hey, everyone has the same 24 hours in the day. Yeah. A lot of folks say, Hey, you should sleep eight hours a day if you want to optimize your health. Yeah. But I've heard you say that you actually prefer most of the week to sleep four or five hours. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Monday through Friday. That's part of my routine. Um, so what I'm doing is you've got, you've got societal norms, right? You've broken societal norms. Right, everyone said, be safe, play it safe, do your government job, put your head down, do that for 20 hours, and you're sleeping your life away and you're missing out on the opportunity, right? Yep. Well, society has all sorts of batshit dumb ideas for everything in life. You need eight hours of sleep. Who said that? Is that true or is that belief driven? Because mm. let me tell you about me. I'm one of the highest energy individuals that I know on the planet. I don't take stimulants. I don't put caffeine in my body. There ain't no Adderall there. I got energy by choice. And this energy starts at 4 a.m. And this energy lasts till 10 p.m. I would say probably 90 or 95% of the time. Once in a while, because uh, my goal is to spend my energy so hard that if I run out by the end of the day, it meant that I left nothing on the table. But for the most part, I got great energy all day long. My body, you know, and everyone has a different body. My beliefs have driven my body to say four to five hours on Monday through Friday is great. Saturday, I'll generally sleep like six hours. And on Sunday, I sleep as much as I can. Sometimes it's five, sometimes it's 10. And I let that be my recuperation day. And then on Monday, I start over again. I'm never tired. And I think it's all training and it's all habit driven. And this is a guy who's constantly, every quarter, I get my blood full panel done. They, they do a workup on me. They look at everything. They look at my adrenals, my cortisol levels. And um, if there's a supplement or something that I can do or a habit that I can put in my body that will give me perfect health, I'm going to do it. Because right now at my age, I am perfectly healthy. And that's what my sleep schedule looks like. And they're testing everything. T levels. Everything. All that stuff. Okay. Yeah, all the hormones, but also just all the panels on just looking at all of my organs and making sure that everything is running the way it's supposed yeah. to. I feel like up until four or five years ago, 
getting, you know, checked for your T levels and testosterone was known as like a dangerous thing. And I think, I think there were studies out there that said it would actually lead to like prostate cancer. But I believe over the last five years that they've severed, that's not true at all. No, dude, right? for, for dude, for, for dudes, like testosterone is the fountain of youth. And if you don't have an optimal amount in your body, then how are you supposed to function optimally? Yeah. Yeah. I agree, man. But that's, but that's just one, right? You can always make more money, but you can't make more time. Mm. You might be able to make more health, but there are some things where you lose it and you don't get it back. So take care of your body. That is your wealth. So what would you say is the greatest asset? Is it time or would you say it's health? Time. Why is that? Yeah. Um, most human beings do not use the time that they have. So I think that most human beings are living in a zombie apocalypse. They are, they are dead to society. Here's, here's what they look like. They, they hunch over. When they talk, they speak real shallow. They breathe shallow. If you put a, a mirror within two inches of their face, they can't fog it. Mm. They try not to stand out. They're quiet. They're back of the room. They're never on the front row. That human being won the freaky freaking lucky sperm club to be here and is wasting their entire life trying so hard to fit in and be an absolute nobody. It's a total waste of life. Now, how are they doing that? Well, most people don't have emotional intelligence. So they'll spend hours a day not being present. They're either reflecting on the past where there's, you know, they're revisiting sad memories over and over again, just thinking about all the bad things that have happened to them. My childhood, my, my, what my neighbor did to me, that I can't believe my best friend did that thing to me. Or they're stuck in the future and there's anxiety about the future. When you're in the past, you're in the future, you can't be present. Like there's nothing you can do in this moment. There's no way I can have a productive conversation with you while I'm thinking about the last fight with my wife. If you do, you're going to experience this hunched over, can't fog a mirror, quiet. So these human beings, They'll lose hours a day just in negativity. Living in the past? Yeah, living in the past. And, and living in the past always breeds negativity. Mm -hmm. Then that negativity robs them the opportunity cost of what they could be creating in this moment as well. Then they're losing time because they don't employ leverage. They don't delegate. Mm -hmm. When you make money, it's not just making your money work for you. The most important thing you do with money when you start making it is not to invest in assets. It's to invest in getting your time back. So all the minutia that you do, pay someone to pay your bills, pay someone to drive the kids around, Pay somebody else to run your errands. Pay somebody to go shopping for you. Pay somebody to pick up your prescriptions. Pay somebody to do your dry cleaning. Pay somebody to fix your house up. Pay somebody to do, uh, to, you know, to, to organize your house, to clean your house. Like you do that, most human beings waste 20 or 30 hours. It's like a mini part-time job that is just doing all the minutia that by the way, doesn't create value. There's no joy in that. So now I've lost, I've got a part-time job doing meaningless things and I have a part to full-time job being a negative human being. You put those two jobs together and you tell me how someone is supposed to climb out of the cesspool and actually go somewhere with their life. They're going to go nowhere fast and they can't figure out why. It's all about leverage. And it's funny because a lot of those folks, where everything that you just alluded to, they're the same ones that say, oh, I can't afford $120 housekeeping. Yep. I can't afford a hundred or yep. $60 car wash. Yep. I'm going to go do it myself. Yep. And then the opportunity cost yep. is the, the higher leverage thing. But the weird thing is take an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur has probably 10 activities that they do in their work life during their week. And there's a couple of those activities that pay them crazy good money. Like 90% of an entrepreneur's income comes from 10% of their activity. It's probably sales calls and it's probably fulfilling really expensive stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, for you, it would be when you're out there evaluating a really good deal, like you don't look at really good deals all day long. There's a small percentage of your time that is spent looking for a really good deal. And when you do, that is where you earn the majority of your money. Everything else is execution of the team, doing the fix up and the repairs and adding value and whatever. And you're just waiting a little bit of time and after a period of time, it's gonna be sold. And when you get the check and you ask, how did I make this money? Well, whether the team did a good or a crappy job fixing up the place, it kind of mattered. Whether you raised rents appropriately, it kind of mattered. You, the time that you spend finding a really good deal, that's, that's one of the most valuable things that you do. Well, then for me, I would say, cool, everything else that you're doing that's not that, stop doing those things. And then recycle that and go enjoy your life. Like, don't, don't obligate yourself like so many people that are like, oh, I got to work, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week. No, you don't. Now, I, bet, I bet in 10 hours a week, you actually make 90% of your money. Mm. So the other time, recycle it and go live the life that you want. Have it both. Have it all. That's so true. Yeah. That's so good. So how, how does one, now let me ask you this, because I, I hear a lot of folks say, delegate to elevate. Yeah. But they say, only delegate if you're going to replace those same hours with a higher and better use. 
Now you're saying there's a caveat to that. You don't necessarily have to replace those hours because you can be as productive as possible doing your highest and best use, but only working 10 hours a week. So I, I have a very, very specific rule that allows me to double my income every year. If you make a list and if you know, if you know the delta between the activity that makes you the most money and the activity that you do that makes you the least money. For example, if I run errands in my business, which is something I used to do, I could pay someone $12 an hour, $15 an hour to do that. But the activity in my business that makes me the most money, I have an activity that I do that makes me a million dollars an hour. My runner's up makes me a half a million dollars an hour. My next runner's up makes me $200,000 an hour. My next runner up makes me $100,000 an hour. So I have four activities between 100,000 and a million dollars. What are those four activities? Um, at a million dollars an hour, that is when I am actually running the machine of my entire real estate portfolio of buying a door a day, but putting in almost no time. I'll put in probably 40 to 50 minutes a month on that activity. And when I compare that to what I'm actually making, it's about a million dollars an hour. If we go all the way down to when I'm privately mentoring people one-on-one, -on -one, that's $100,000 an hour. So we'll just take those two activities. Now, if I look at anything below that line of demarcation, there's plenty of things that I can do that will make me $20,000 an hour, $6,000 an hour, $2,000 an hour. And if I want, I can run errands in my company, build PowerPoints for $15 an hour. If you know your highest level activities, everything that is above that line, the line of demarcation, you have to only say yes this year to activities that are twice as valuable as your current most valuable and say no to everything else. You follow that rule right there and every year your financial life will grow out of control. And it means that I'm always training my replacement that is going to be doing whatever it is I'm doing right now, which is always my goal. I'm always clone Chris, clone Chris. Yeah, that's so good. I recently sat down with, with my team and just kind of going through the same process. I'm like, man, I am doing too much. And I got really, really amazing team members um, that are smarter than I am with a lot of the stuff within the business. And so I know right now I'm identifying my highest and best use. And that is, you know, content, putting together deals, visionary, um, and doing podcasts like this, right? That's my highest and best use and raising capital. And so it's like, how can I delegate more so I can focus on this? Yeah. And so over the next quarter, Q4 this year, we're going to kind of overhaul. I'm going to promote a couple of girls on the team. I'm going to give them more responsibility yeah. so I can focus on my highest and best use. Now, the, the most important thing is in the who, because most entrepreneurs, I'm not going to accuse you of this, but I just in general, like for everyone listening, when it's time to delegate, what we love to do is to delegate to people that we can control. And this is a weird hierarchical alpha weird thing that we just do is, is when I say control, I mean, I want to find someone that I think is dumber than me. And I want to ask them to do the task. And by the way, if you find someone quote unquote, that's dumber than you to do the task, because that's what you're looking for, guess what kind of job they're going to do below satisfaction. Mediocre. And then you're going to build this story that I can't trust people and they never meet my standards. I'm like, dumb shit. That's because you hire dumb shit. Mm -hmm. What you do instead is go hire epic, smart human beings that are better than you. Go find someone who is better than you. The person running my household, my head of household, she is a masterful organizer and um, she can organize things way better than me. My house is always like, I always have everything that I need. She, she, does, she preps all my supplements. She takes, you know, does all my meal prep on my food to get it done, runs the errands, picks up the prescriptions. Like she keeps my life so organized. And if I had to do her job, I wouldn't do it as well. And I would hate doing it. Mm. And so you got to find people that, that that's their lane, that that's their passion, that 85% of people hate what they do for a living. Find the 15% that love it and find the people that are better than you. And, and that's, a, that's an ego blow to a lot of business owners. And yeah, so, it is. Yeah. I hear it all the time. It's yeah. like, oh, I tried to delegate and hire it out, but it didn't work out because our, our production dropped off. I'll never hire again. It's yeah. like, okay, well, you just didn't hire the right person. Correct. It always comes down to the who game. And so how do you, you know, for me, you know, in terms of like, how do you hire the right person? I, I've learned this, I've been fortunate enough to learn this early on, yeah. is like, I will pay up, I will give a slice of equity to all these deals we're buying to, to key team members, yeah. um, and I will take care of them, because I know by paying a little bit more, I'm gonna get three, four, five times the output, yeah. than the other person that's like, hey, I'm gonna go pay market rate. Yeah, so but first of all, that's actually really good. It's like, if you're gonna find people that are way better than average, then you need to pay them better than average. And I find often that when you find the right people, that they're equivalent of two or three people in their mm -hmm. space. So you're definitely looking for, you're looking for, for talent density. 
which means I got to find people that are overqualified. Mm. Those are the people that I want to surround myself with. Overqualified, smart people. Like this goes back to Henry Ford, right? The yep. dude's like, I don't know how to build a car, but I will be the one that is known for modernizing the world with bringing, you know, combustion engines into the marketplace. So I'm going to need, um, I need scientists, I need engineers, I need fabricators, I need all these different people. And what I'm going to do is what Sir Richard Branson says he does. My job is to have a clear vision. My job is to have a clear vision. Then I find the world's best people and I get out of their way. I love that. And so in my world, you're like, well, how do you do this? I say, you got to slow down to go fast. And where I would slow down is I would get so crystal clear on that job description. I would know exactly what you want them to be able to do. But most people stop at job description and that's how you get a crappy employee because anyone can lie in an interview. The second thing is you actually already need to know your critical drivers and key performance indicators. So in the very first interview, I need you to produce X units of this every day so that every week you hit X KPY. These are the drivers to produce the outcome, the cause and the effect. And a lot of people don't do that. It's strange. But in the interview, they talk about adjectives. I'm like, the, a business doesn't run on adjectives. A business runs on numbers. Mm -hmm. So use your adjectives for a job description. Then you got to go in and say, hey, here's exactly with numbers and formulas what you're going to be doing. And then number three, here's the mission of the company. Can you really get behind the mission the way we're behind the mission? And if they don't get all three of those, I'm not ready to post the job and I'm not ready to hire someone. I may have the need, but I'm not prepared. So for you guys, what is, what is the mission? Hey guys, real quick, the only way this podcast grows is if you guys share it and review the show. So if you do find value, if you could take two seconds and drop a five star on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, it would mean the world to me. But more importantly, it will help us reach new audiences and help more people build wealth through real estate investing. It's help people reach their potential. That is the mission of all of my companies, help people reach their potential. So whether it's clients, investors, partners, you're trying to maximize their potential and help yeah. them win. You know, no one, no one wants to partner with me in the game of real estate because they want millions of dollars. That's not what they want. They want the millions of dollars because there's a lifestyle they want to live. Well, what is the lifestyle that you want to live? You have to get to the bottom of what it is that they actually want. What do they see their life actually looking like? And when you get all the way down to the end of the line, here's what you get. I want to reach my potential. Mm -hmm. And if I do that, I'm growing. And if I'm growing, I'm happy. Yeah, happiness stems from growth and progress. Yeah. I didn't learn that till a few years ago. Yeah. And once I did, I was like, everything just started clicking for yeah. me, yeah. you know? Um, so I'm curious, you know, you, you got kids, right? Family, yeah, four kids. Four kids. Yeah. And I know you do some homeschooling with them, right? Tell me your thoughts on the public school system. Uh, well, it, it's, it's garbage, right? I mean, it's, um, listen, my kids are a total social experiment. I could be doing it totally wrong. But I basically, once my oldest was old enough to get into junior high and that started not going well, I said, we're not doing that. We're going to world school. And homeschool, it's, it's, I don't really like the word so much because often it implies this idea that mom and dad are the teachers. And I'm like, we're not the teachers. I think that's what most people uh, uh, think. Yeah, you know, so this is, like, this is like private education without yeah. a private school. Meaning I, my wife and I, we went out and we, we find our teachers. Um, it's, by the way, do you know how cool it is to put together like the resume builder that you want from a teacher. It's like, I want everything. I want you to be healthy and fit instead of fat, sick and dead. So I want you to be healthy. Um, I want you to like be pouring into your passions and hobbies. Um, I want to define success in a certain way. I want your relationships to look a certain way. Maybe I want you to have a certain theological background. Like I can do whatever I want. My wife and I put out the most elaborate job posting to find teachers that are like, they're at the height of their career, they're the most experienced and they have this passion. Their life is about literally pouring into the next generation, everything. We find those people, we bring them into our home and we have our children educated that way. And that means that we've got the flexibility that when we're in Japan for three weeks, they're with us. If we're on a private yacht in the Galapagos, our teachers are worth us and world school is going on. Um, you know, if my wife and our Iceland, we don't take our kids, but we know that our kids are somewhere in the world. Like, like this week, my kids are in Boston mm. and they're with their teachers and, um, they're going to go there and, and, and instead of like learning our founding history in a book, they're actually going to go and discover our founding history. Um, and so my, our philosophy is ultimately, um, you don't need to know chemistry. You don't need to be an engineer. You don't need to know calculus. Um, all of this well-rounded garbage that society says that you need. I don't believe in that. I believe we live in a world today that no one cares what you've memorized. What you need to do is develop your mind. You need to know what you're good at. You do need to be well-rounded, but not to the length society says. And I find out what my kids are good at and we lean into that. Are you, are you the one teaching the money or your teachers are teaching your kids no, about I money? No, I teach money. Okay. So yeah. you, you find time every week to teach every, them a little bit about money. Every Tuesday, uh, 
every Tuesday when I pull them together, I have them invite all their friends from the neighborhood. Um, that are oh, you also, bring the other kids in too. Oh, you have to. See, mom and dad are never cool, right? But if you bring in their kids, the kids know I'm rich. And that's really cool to them. They know I'm a YouTuber. That's really cool to them. My kids take that for granted, just like mm -hmm. any kids do with their parents. They think it's normal. So, uh, their kids, so my kids are social referencing their friends who are loving Chris time. And Uncle Chris is basically teaching money from A to Z. Like last week, we talked vending machines. You pay $2,000 for a vending machine. You fill it with $400 of goods, $200 of goods. You make $400. You make $200 a week. How many months will it take before it's paid off? And then how do you scale the business? And then how do you hand it off to somebody else? And how do you, in 12 months, have someone else running your business, making you $50,000 a year, instead of going to school for four years, going $200,000 in debt so that you can land a $50,000 a year job? Do some of the, the kids' parents come over and, and learn too? Yes, they actually, <laughs> they? they actually do. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so how many teachers do you have working for you? Two. Two, okay. Yep, so I have two, two, two teachers, and then I have one staff that kind of goes in and out. Yeah, for and, and I imagine you pay them more. And, and teachers is a little different, right? Like my oldest daughter right now, um, for the last two years, she's been doing a media internship. Instead of going to college two years from now and getting a four-year you know, liberal arts degree in media, I hired a custom professor to give her that education in two years, streamlined one-on-one, -on -one, has her right now on movie sets. Like she is in that world doing it and editing and causing those things. And um, by the time she graduates high school, it, you know, for me, that's the equivalent of a four-year degree in college. Yeah. And she still may choose to go to college, but now she has a real skill set. What do you tell your kids on college in, in terms of should they go to college or should they not? Um, college is for some people. Uh, if you want to be a doctor, you have to go to college. If you want to be an engineer, you have to go to college. If you want to be a lawyer currently, you have to go to college. Um, I'm teaching my children more about access and entrepreneurship. And I'm, I'm giving them a heavy influence on in that, but ultimately it's their life and they can choose for themselves. So what do you, and I agree with you, um, you know, if you're going to be an attorney, doctor, whatever, like you should go to college, you need to. Um, and if you want to go become a real estate investor, entrepreneur, okay, don't go to college. But what about the folks that are in between and they don't know what they want to do? Should they go to college? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think it's going to be solved individually for each person. And there's some, like I've even told my kids, like, listen, if you want to go to college so you can have the social experience and you want to continue developing your mind and you don't know what you want to do, I'll also be cool with that too. But please, whatever you do, don't get brainwashed into picking a career that you're not passionate about and thinking that that's what you're going to do for the next 40 years. Cause that nobody does that. Yeah. I, I agree with that. So for the folks out there that, you know, are 19, 20, 21, and they're like, I don't know what I want to do. Yeah. How do you suggest they find their passion? Well, 94% of really Gen want? Zers, guess what they all want? What's that? So they want a gig. They're in the gig economy. They want entrepreneurship to some extent. You said we, 95%? 94. We have wow. never, we have never been in that strong of a demographic where entrepreneurship it's like people are waking up to it's like college is lame, jobs are lame. They 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 want more freedom and flexibility. And and why why is that? Is that because there's never been more people like you uh, in access to YouTube, social media, the podcast? I think that's a big part of it. That are educating. I mean, shoot, half these kids want to be YouTubers, and I'm like, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make money doing yeah. that thing. You got to have my some, son, my backend product. My 15 year old son like posted his first video. He's like, Dad, I only got four views, and you're one of them and mom's one of them, <laughs> right? He knew how all four views came from. I'm like, well, you know, wake up, like, welcome to that game. It's going to be hard work. And here's what that means. You probably need to post more and you didn't create enough value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? No, that's, it's just that's real. A, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. So I'm curious, you, I'd imagine you pay your teachers probably more than what the public school oh, system yeah. is teaching oh, or yeah. paying. Yes. You got to. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying. I'm paying, I'm, I'm, I'm paying them way more than the school system because the school system is doing it wrong. And what I'm really teaching my kids to do, my, my, my teachers to do is I'm teaching them to teach my kids to love learning. And I'm teaching them to be children of value, humans of value. When you create value, you get paid in life. If you don't like the money you're making, I got news for you. You're a commodity and you're not creating enough value. So if you want to get paid more money, then you have to become more valuable and you have to do what other people aren't willing to do. That's mm -hmm. the lesson. That's powerful. And it goes back to what you said. You said, take care of team members, pay them extra or pay them more than, than, than base or, or whatever the, the norm is market. And you're going to get a lot more output. And yes. it's really the same thing. Yeah. A part of it is just also valuing them and just saying, Hey, like my world's, they, by the way, my teachers love working. We're like, yeah. I don't have to balance 30 brats. Uh -huh. I don't get to burned out from all of the kids that I don't want to teach. Like they got to come in and interview and we got to form this great chemistry alchemy between our kids and them. And 
And uh, dude, we're, we're having an epic time. And you guys get to travel all over the world yeah. with the teachers. That's one of the biggest reasons why I need it out of the school system because they don't have a lot of flexibility for my lifestyle. Yeah, I agree, man. So uh, speaking of traveling, what, what's the coolest trip that you guys have took with the family? Oh my gosh. I, I would have to say that last year when we did the Galapagos, we rented this, this 150 foot yacht and we started just going from island to island seeing my, my kids, we're really, we're, we're, we're like, uh, we're animal lovers. So going and seeing the endemic species, you know, the Darwin species, if you mm -hmm. will, in the Galapagos, which is an unpopulated set of islands. So you, you can only get there by boat and raft and yacht. And so every day the yacht pulls us up somewhere to some new island. We got to take the raft out, either walk on the island and, and, and just see the amazing animal life. Or dude, one day we got to go and swim with all of these sea lions and they came up on the beach and were performing. I kid you not, they are, they are natural artists doing circus acts. Uh, you know, we swam with a school of a hundred, uh, turtles, like epic, epic memories living and sleeping on that boat. Um, that was a, that was pretty cool. What does a yacht like that run to a charter for a week? Uh, I think that one was like 70 or 80 or $90,000, something like that. Yeah. I love that, man. Epic vacations. Yeah. So, uh, I know, I know you, you were in the private jet space. Actually, one of my podcast guests recently, uh, Nick Marietta. He says that um, he like partnered with you on on one of the private jets. Is that true? Yeah, it is. Yeah, he's yeah. a small owner on one of them. What? Uh, how many jets do you have? Um, I got two jets right now. Um, so when I got in the game, I kind of got a starter jet. It was a little eight seater. Which one? Um, it's a Nextant four hundred. Nextant four hundred. I used That's to do like ATC. I'm trying to think of which one that is. Okay. It's like a Beechcraft. Got it. Okay. And seats eight. It's not a really huge fuselage. Um, it's like a flying minivan. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's what it feels like when I'm in. I'm six foot four. Yeah. And two hundred fifty pounds. So. You know, um, I did it for a year, took the thing everywhere, had grand adventures, learned the game of flying private. And then after I felt comfortable with it, invested in a, in a Falcon 50 That's and, nice uh, I'm enjoying that jet right now. And I'm um, probably going to do a Falcon 900 next mm. and graduate to like a 16 seater. I love that. What the, what's the Falcon 900 run cost wise? Um, probably the one I want is probably going to be somewhere between nine and 12 million. Yeah. That's not too bad. Jet riding, jet, you know, flying private is actually really affordable. Um, I'm pissed that any of my earlier mentors didn't tell me that like, hey, put put that on your vision board, bro. Because, um, you, you know, I thought jets were for people that were like worth $100 million or, you know, were a crazy flush liquid. I'm like, no, it's actually really, especially if you charter it when you're not using it. It's like, no, if you if you intelligently manage the jet, you know, you, you might spend on a jet, you know, in the range that I'm playing in, you know, quarter million to three quarter million dollars a year for flying private and being able to have all those seats and go wherever you want, whenever you want. Mm -hmm. That's totally worth it. So with the maintenance, um, you guys, in, you're chartering it out to other people when you're not using it yeah. with the maintenance and all that stuff. Um, you, you break even or close to it. Um, um, on my jet that I, the first jet that I no longer really use anymore, that one makes me money. Wow. And the one that I use twice a month, three times a month, that one, that one costs me money. And so between the two of them, they're pretty close to a break even. Yeah. Yeah. And tell me about the tax benefits with owning a jet. Oh my gosh. So, you know, um, my very first jet I paid around $3 million for and, uh, under section 179, it's definitely over 6,000 pounds, which meant that I got to write off 100% of it, you know, for all of my business usages. And in the first year? In the first year. Wow. So imagine, imagine my income taking 3 million right off the top, that $3 million, uh, you know, I was going to have to basically pay 40% federal and 6%, 6.5% state close to 50%. Right. So I was going to pay 1.3, $1.4 million to the government, but instead I bought a $3 million jet. I put down like three quarter of a million dollars and then I got to write the entire thing off. So it was either give the government 1.4 or pony up 700. And yeah. by ponying up 700, I netted like six, $700,000 that went to my pocket uh, for buying the jet. I love that. That's huge. Do most folks, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the smart money play when buying a jet? Do you, you, put, you finance it, pay cash, or, or do you lease yeah, it? Yeah, the smart money move is you, is you, is you put the, the smallest down payment and you charter it with the best charter company. Yeah. Because like there's a lot What's, of crappy charter companies out there that too, right? Like you want that thing in the air, racking up mileage and money as much as possible. What's debt look like on a, on a jet? 
what kind of turn is it it's similar to like boats yeah i think so um you know i think on my first jet my payment is like i don't know it's like 12 or eighteen thousand a month or something like that okay yeah it's not bad and then falcon 900 will be next yeah i love that so uh dude i'm curious you know with this compound you're building the jets you want to get the falcon 900 your kids are doing some badass stuff um you built this amazing team like what I'm sure your why has changed over the years. We were riding over here with one of your, your drivers, Vivian. Yeah. Um, and she was speaking very highly of you. She's like, hey, I've, I've known Chris for five years. Um, five years ago, he, he was a lot more quiet, a little bit more, you know, reserved. But she's like, now he's a lot more charismatic and loud in a good way. She goes, if you want to feel good about yourself, go hang out with Chris. Nicest <laughs> guy you ever meet. And I see that now, like yeah. the energy and all that. But I'm sure like your why has changed. Like, what was your why five years ago? And what is oh, it? What geez. is it today? I mean, even my why in the beginning was like, make $10 million, never work again. Like it, it was something stupid with it was all selfish. It was just like, get me out of this rat race. You thought you were gonna go sit on the beach and retire? Yeah. Um, and then when I actually retired, I was like, okay, I tried it for six months. I'm like, that is, okay. Life force depleting rapidly. Um, I'm not retired at 26 to do nothing with my life. Chris, you're be a person of value. Same lesson I'm teaching my kids. Go create value for people because, you know, Tony Robbins says the secret to living is giving. When you are in service of other people and when you're using your talents and abilities to nurture and help other people, that's a feeling that you can't buy. It's only earned by choices that you make. Mm. And so, you know, a part of my life, you know, my wife and I, we have a foundation. Um, we're just planning our fourth trip to Ukraine right now. We'll go into Ukraine. We'll go near enemy lines. We'll do very critical humanitarian aid drops for refugees that don't have supplies. Otherwise, we'll pull people actually out of danger. Um, you know, my second mission, we went in and we rescued 12 people from a neighborhood that was receiving indirect fire. That was for sure the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and yet it was one of the most meaningful things to me. Um, and so my wife and I, we get lost right now in our um, you know, there, there's uh, in, in Guatemala, in Mexico, we have safe houses where kids that are rescued out of sex trafficking, we're helping rehabilitate them, bring them back to life and get them properly placed, get them the therapy and things that they need. So, you know, right now, a lot of the motivation for more is just to rotate more. And it's like, okay, Chris, like, are you capable of rotating a hundred million dollars in your life? Then do that. Redistribute that wealth on your terms. Chris, are you capable of a billion? Like I got another hundred years in me, so I'm going for a trillion. We don't have a trillionaire yet on the planet, but why not, right? At the rate that I'm playing the asymmetric upside game of, of private equity, uh, you know, I, I basically launched 10 companies a year that have billion dollar potential. And this is my second year of doing that. And this year we've already identified, you know, um, five of them. And if I do that for the next 10 years, the goal is to launch 100 companies that have billion dollar plus potential. I hope a dozen of them make it. And I hope the other ones do really well and some won't make it, but it'll average out really, really well. And so um, I use part of my life as in part-time, you know, I'm 25 to 30 hours a week and the goal is really simple. Make as much money as possible, creating as much value as possible and then give it away. I love that. Yeah. So are you more into buying pre-existing businesses or are you only doing startups? No, a lot of them aren't startups. They're actually just mergers or acquisitions. Um, some of them are startups, but a number of them are, you know, this, you know, I'm picking up companies that have been in existence for a long time. And so I look at all of it. Um, startups are hard. Right. I, 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 at this point, I know how to do a startup really easy because I, I've identified we're going to start day one with the CEO. We're going to start, you know, day one with the full team. We're going to have all the financials in place and we're going to let them run. Uh, but it's nice when you actually acquire a mature company that is doing its thing that you can step into and also mature further. You know, and my, you're looking for big multiple exits. Like you're looking for, oh, 50X, dude, we're, we're, we're heavy in fintech right now. I'm looking for yep. 20 X and 30 X and 50 X multiples. And um, so we're also strategic in that in that way as well. Yeah, because they say 90% of millionaires are made through real estate, but 100% of billionaires are made through private equity. Yeah. And so you got the real estate play yes. that allows you to, that gives you the safe haven yes. to go out and take risks and take shots at all these different startups. Well, like, give you the higher I, multiple. I, I, look at, I look at me and you and I'm like, okay, I started as a real estate investor. I mm -hmm. built my net worth. The second thing that I did is I started getting on social and I built an education company, teaching people how to do what I did. By that time, I had a company that I owned 100%. And when it was so flush, it was like, what's next? And I had discretionary money. I was like, dude, are you really just going to go and buy more real estate? Like, don't you think you're a little heavily allocated into that? Like, let's get into business. And all I had was really one successful business outside of my investments. And so I remember when I started my second one, I was like, oh my gosh, a lot of the lessons that are working in this business are going to be applied here. And now that business is working. After a half a dozen iterations, I learned the... Uh, the commonalities in most businesses. 
They need a, a really strong culture. They need their KPIs. They need to be have a certain level of leadership, et cetera. And so now it's just like, okay, now what I'm doing is I'm iterating companies that are designed to be some of the most successful on the planet. And that's what we're going to go for. And, um, you know, I, the fun part is I get to wake up every morning and just ask, w what is an impossible problem in the world I want to try to solve? Yeah, I yeah. love that. What, what, I'm curious, what does your team look like with everything that you're doing? What, is your, what does your team look like? Um, so I have a couple hundred members of my team, um, you know, spread over my companies. And um, I've got a... It starts at the top with Carson Tejan, who is, you know, sits at the, you know, he's the, he's the board of directors. So all the companies report up to him. And then he has direct reports that manage silos of companies. And I've got CEOs on all of my companies. And basically they're all being matured, built and developed to grow. And, and we're just having fun. Of the couple hundred, how many are here locally in Provo versus, um, versus virtual? Um, I would say that probably 30% of my force, 40% of my force is in person. Mm -hmm. The rest are virtual. When did you start getting into like the social media content and all that? Cause I mean, you, you built this audience, yeah. um, and you've been an inspiration for me in my, my early, you know, years getting into real estate investing entrepreneurship. Um, so thank you for that, by the way. You're welcome. Um, when did you start, you know, when did you first realize like, Hey, I'm going to start building an audience on social. I'm going to start providing value to other folks. You know, it was maybe like eight, seven, eight years ago, this guy came up to me. His name's Nate Woodbury. And he said, I think that, yeah, I've seen you at your seminars. I think you do really well on YouTube. And so he said, I'm going to come to your house once every three months and just give me two days. And we're going to film a whole bunch of videos and I'll just drop them every week. And we'll just start with one a week. So for the first year, we just dropped one a week and started getting a little bit of traction. Then he said, Chris, we need to go to three a week. Let's film monthly. And once we went to three week, uh, we started getting way more traction. And um, by the third year, I just said, hey, this is really going somewhere. And I basically bought all my social out from under him. I wanted to run it internally, build my brand the way that I wanted to. And so I'd say really for the last five or six years, it's been, it's been super intentional. And um, I feel blessed. I've got just beautiful souls that I'm able to connect with and create value for. And even some of the trolls that really, really hate me, I, I, that gets me a little excited too. It's still attention, right? Yeah. What, so what does the, the content kind of team look like and how do you kind of structure that weekly in terms of schedule? You know, um, so I do my long form once a week and I do all my shorts like once a month. Okay. So, um, you, you know, we will we'll keyword research. What are the YouTube videos and podcasts that people want to hear about? Not what I want to talk about. What do they want to, what do they want to talk about? And I want to have those conversations. Um, but I'm having most of my joy on my short channel, on my shorts, because that's where I feel like I can really just be me. Right. When I keyword research, people are like, tell me how to do accelerated depreciation on these real estate deals. I'm like, OK, I've got that knowledge base. We can go there. But on my shorts, I get to talk about everything, like anything that I want to. And um, and that's where I really enjoy just connecting with my community the most. Um, you know, I'm blessed that there's a beautiful business to back it up. But, you know, that business money comes in from point zero, whatever percent of actually the real value that gets to be created with everyone for free. It's like my favorite business model. I get to just play. I get to create value. I get to inspire. I get to help. I get to educate as many people as possible. Every week is usually five to 10 million people. And then at the end of the day, a handful of them will actually come and say, hey, like, let's do some business together. I'm like, cool. That, that also makes the machine work so that there's some give and receive. And, uh, and I love it. Yeah. I started doing like, uh, with, a lot more long form. And you mentioned going from one a week to three a week. And we just recently did that. We were at two a week. I'm like, hey, let's 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 increase the volume and let's get better at it. So we're always looking at ways to improve the podcast. But one of the things I found with the long form is it's like the long form, actually, you chop it up and that's a lot of your short form. You don't have to do as much short form. Yes, but the short form is not as successful as when you create shorts. Strategic just for the short form. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I like it's a 400 X difference. You think so? No. I you know, know so. <laughs> yeah. how, so how much, how much, like if you were allocating a short form versus the long form, is it 50, 50, or would you say it's a little bit skewed one direction? Well, I mean, short, long form, you're not going to, I mean, all you can really do is post on YouTube and the podcast channels. That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so outside of that, you know, I've got hundreds of shorts. Just last week I got together with my buddy Ryan and we shot 150 videos in a day and a half. Ryan who? Yeah, uh, Ryan Magan. Okay. And he'll, he'll post those for the next three months and four months. And so I'm kind of done on shorts for the next three months. So I'm, I'm big on batching, mm. right? I'll do a half day on Monday. That's my video day. And then, and then, um, you know, once a quarter I'll batch yeah. out. Love Ryan, by the way, he was out in uh, San Diego. I had him on my show about a month ago 
and he came to one of my, my meetups afterwards, but uh, we got to hang out. We went out afterwards and good dude. So, so you outsource your content to Ryan. Sometimes on that one I do. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So he, he flies out here. You guys do short form what, yep. every couple months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Good dude. Um, so what's next for you, man? You know, um, I'm, I'm in this really weird place in my life where, um, I'm, I'm just deep in the game of ascension. I What's do, that? do a lot of meditating, a lot of spiritual work, a lot of connecting with, with God. Um, and, um, do a lot of retreats around that. A lot of spiritualism. Um, I, I, I feel like we're really living in the matrix. Everything here is an assimilation and none of it's real. It just looks real. It feels real. It seems real. But I think it's one big distracting game. I think it's an assimilation for training. It's fun to learn about the game of money. It's fun to you know get my body healthy and, and to create these beautiful memories with family. But there are a few things that matter the most in life and most of what we're spending our life doing don't matter at all. What are those few things? Um, I think that the people that we feel called to connect with, the memories that we create with them, the lessons that we're extracting and learning from life, and how close we connect to God, that's the game that I'm interested in. That is way more meaningful than anything else that I do. I've heard you say that you think that you're gonna live to 144 years old. That's not what I really believe, that's just what I say on social media. <laughs> really? Yeah. Why can you do it? Well, th think about it this way. Um, we are a byproduct of our belief system, right? So if I say, I'm not wealthy, but I'm gonna figure it out. I'm not wealthy, I'm gonna figure it out. Where do you think I'll be in 10 years? Do you think wealthy? I'll be wealthy? You're gonna figure it out. I, I don't think I'm gonna figure it out. Do you know why? Why? Because in a decade from now, I'm gonna be figuring it out. Yeah. Mm. The same thing like when someone says, I'm trying. Do you know where they're gonna be a week from now? They're gonna figure it out? No. Nope. They're gonna be trying. So. You gotta commit is what you're saying. Yeah, well, listen, I've been believing since January 15, 2009 that I'm a billionaire. Next year, I believe that'll actually be true for the first time, but I've been living in my mind palace, in my meditative state every day as a billionaire. I treat myself like a billionaire. I act like a billionaire. Sometimes I even spend like a billionaire. And um, I don't believe that someday I'll be a billionaire. I believe I am a billionaire. I am. The great I am is what we end up becoming in life. It's what we're willing to believe present tense today. So if I believe I'm gonna live to be 144 years old, what I'm really believing is that I'm gonna age slowly. I'm gonna age more slowly than other people. My real belief is I'm immortal. How and, much? And I'm gonna live forever. How much money do you spend a year on health and wellness? Hundreds of thousands, yeah. And where, where does that money go? A um, variety of things. Um, you know, the spa that I'm building in my, in my, in my complex, um, I've got float spa for those that have ever done deprivation tra training. Um, I've got, um, you know, cold spa, um, I've got red light sauna therapy, I've got Deleuze shower, um, hot sauna, massage room. Um, you know, I can do most of my practices there in that space. So between my, my, my rigorous workouts in the morning and then doing a number of those treatments and then taking all of the, all of the supplements. I made a video the other day where I piled up all of my supplements on a table and then like I'm taking two big fist fills, fistfuls of pills every day every day to get everything in. So between that and then the eating, um, that's all dedicated towards this idea of I, I don't age. And you don't drink alcohol, right? No, no I don't, I don't do that. Did you ever? No, no stimulants, no caffeine. What about your fitness routine? It's always changing. Um, right now I'm, I'm in between bodybuilding shows. I've got a fourth show in 2024. I'm starting to waver on my commitment. I'm starting to wonder if it's a bad idea. To the shows? Yeah. Why? I'm. I'm trying to gain 30 pounds right now. I'm up 10. I've got 20 more to go. And when I start consuming over 6,000 calories a day, like everything inside my body says, this is not healthy. I see what you're trying to do. I see what you're putting in me. And my body is fighting back. It's pushing back hard. And it says, hey, you're going to get the size. You're going to grow. But is this really what you want? And is the bodybuilder at that size, is that the healthiest version of you? Mm. So there's a part of me that I have a number of reasons why I would love to be 265 pounds lean on stage or even just... 250 cut at 3% body fat. What a fun game. I'd love to do that. Um, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm wrestling right now because in this moment, but for the last week, I've just been stuck where I feel like my body and my higher self is saying, there's a higher level of health and vitality than what you're pursuing. And I'm like, 
uh, I made a commitment. Like I got my fourth show. I've got three more after that. And, and are, you, are you doing weight cuts before you get on stage? Oh yeah. That, how much like, are you, how much are you cutting before you get on stage? Uh, you know, I usually don't get above 15% body fat. So the cut isn't that bad. The cut is usually five months, four months. Um, now and, what, what about the cut? Like, you know, 48 hours to, right before you get on. Oh, you, like, oh, like, like right fighters, oh, right? the, the week, the you week, dehydrate yourself, the right? week before, like, <laughs> like going down to where even the day of you're literally drinking, you're drinking nothing, bro. You, I, 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 I'm a UFC fan. So I watch these fighters, but oh, yeah. like the fight week and yes. what they go put their bodies through yes. is insane. Like some of these guys like Dustin Poirier, Max Holloway. I mean, they talk about taking fights last minute as a fill in yeah. and showing up literally fight week. 35 pounds over what they're supposed to fight at yeah. and just cutting 35 pounds in seven days. Like that's yeah. so brutal for your body. It is. What's the most you've cut? We in, don't, in we the don't, week we don't cut that hard though um, for bodybuilding. Cause if you do, you're going to lose mass muscle mass. Mm. So the reason why it's like a five month cut is because the goal is to actually grow your muscle if you can and only strip the fat off, you know? So like in my gainer phase right now, I'm on 700 carbs and 400 grams of protein a day and then less than 100 grams of fats. Those macros I cannot, even though I'm eating 700 grams of carbs and everything clean, you'd think someone's got to get fat. I am putting no fat on my body eating 700 grams of carbs because I'm actually only having 78 grams of fats. You can have all the carbs in the world if you don't have fats. And all it does is turn to energy. How much are you eating in protein a day? 400 grams. Does that change whether you're cutting or, or building? Yeah. When I'm, uh, when I'm building, that's what I'm on. When I'm cutting, it'll, be, it'll probably be closer to 250. And then carbs will be cut substantially and fats will almost be non-existent. How much in calories are you eating daily when you're cutting versus building? Building, 6,000 plus. Cutting, 3,000. Dropping all the way down to maybe 2,400. What's the typical meal like when you're building? Oh, man. Um, a dozen eggs for breakfast. A cup of oatmeal. A um, couple slices of, of bread. Um, and then it's like chicken and rice. Like for two or three meals. And then, a, you know, sometimes it's red meat and potatoes, really big, heavy, heavy meals. You don't eat veggies? Yeah. But you know what, when you're eating this much food, sometimes I just take my greens in through the powder because it is just, it, it it's, it's 6,000 calories when you're eating unhealthy is like, it's like this, right? But when you're eating 6,000 healthy, it is, it is such a huge quantity. That's actually what I'm struggling with right now is it's like, I got my, I got my supplementation down. I've got my injections down. I've got my lifting routine down. The food, the food, that much food. <laughs> it's a lot. Now, when you're cutting, what are you eating? Um, usually the exact same thing, just portion control. Okay. Yeah. So it just doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever take a day, a day once, like once a week and you're like, Hey, I'm going to eat whatever today. Like, do you have cheat meals? On a build, on a build, I, I have a cheat meal. What, what's your favorite cheat meal? You know, the weird thing is like, if you had like seen me Chris Crone 10, 15 years ago, I was big on sweets. Like I don't eat very much of that stuff anymore. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually, it doesn't reside in my body as something delicious. So even if I were to have ice cream, it's like half a scoop. Mm. Or if I were to eat, you know, like cookies, I'd have a cookie. What about fast food, like In-N-Out? No, no, no. Chick-fil-A? I, I, I know it's big up here I in Utah. I, I can't. <laughs> no. It, no it no just, pizza? So the weird thing is eating clean means that my, my, my system and my body is always so clean. So when I introduce something into it, like a, a burger, my body's just like, dude, what are you doing? Mm. Why, why did you put that in here? That doesn't make sense in this ecosystem that you've built. Yeah. No, that makes I saw you snacking. Um, Earlier when we recorded, and you had some grapes up here, and what, what, what else was in there? Um, grapes, turkey, and some chicken. That's easy. Yeah, I'm about to start doing that on, on my podcast days. Yeah. yeah, I love that, man. So, dude, it's been amazing having you on, dude. Such a pleasure, um, and I appreciate you having me out there, man. It's it's uh, it's cool to see everything that you built here, uh, meet your team, and to hear how others on your team kind of talk about you. Um, it's been great, and like I said, man, you've been inspiration for me um, along my journey, and. Um, you still inspire me today. I mean, you asked me earlier, really, like who, who you look up to. And Michelle, I'm curious for you. Who are the, who are the folks that inspire you today? Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually finding a lot of it in books right now. Mm. So mentorship has kind of changed gears for me because there was a time in my life when mentorship meant I've got to pay to join someone's mastermind. And, um, a good example is Russell Brunson, Russell Brunson, um, deep admiration for him. I've, I've piled so many millions of dollars through his click funnels, 
and uh, but never had a chance to meet him. I could have paid to join a mastermind, but I found an organic way to connect with him for a couple of days, more one-on-one -on -one in Vegas that was really, really meaningful to me. Um, often the people that I admire, um, we actually go into business with each other. Really? And, and so because, uh, yeah, so my favorite form of mentorship, like, you know, you take a look at Roland Frazier. The, the dude in the M&A field has participated in over 1,000 exits. I need his knowledge. So what did I do? I did some consult for equities with him on some of my bigger tech companies. And now he's participating. And now I have access to all of his storehouses of wisdom and knowledge and information. Um, so a lot of my mentors are actually people that I now approach. And I have enough attractive thingies that we can find some synergy. And so I basically get to mentor with my business partners. That's one of my favorite hacks that I'm doing right now is I, I just have so many cool people in my life that I love learning from. Uh, and, and we get to do it playing on that, on that level now. Mm -hmm. Regarding the click funnels, would you say if there's one, one person that you should model after for any entrepreneur, would it, would it be him? Russell? I think, I think he's still number one and has it the most figured out mm. for sure. Okay. That's good to know. Well, I appreciate you coming on, my man. Thank Such a rich. pleasure. And uh, dude, when you're out in San Diego, man, love to do another podcast and uh, maybe we can do a couple meetups out there. Sounds good, brother. Thank yeah. you. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.